Good evening and welcome. I am Rhonda Haynes. I serve as Executive Director for the National Association for Urban Debate Leagues, also known as NODL. When criminal justice reform was announced as this year's high school debate topic, we at NODL knew we had to do something beyond competition. In developing the concept for I Resolve, tonight's program, we set out to engage youth in real conversation about criminal justice reform. During tonight's program, students representing the Los Angeles Metropolitan Debate League will explore ways the plea bargaining can contribute to mass incarceration versus how structural issues like mandatory minimum sentences exacerbate the same problem. With I Resolve, debaters move beyond competition and into the realm of real world solutions, taking on tough topics and engaging respected experts and prof professionals along the way. There will be no small talk here tonight, folks. We are tremendously overwhelmed by the outpouring of professional support for tonight's event. And we have no shortage of esteemed guest speakers and panelists who are thrilled to delve into serious discussion with our debaters. Throughout tonight's program, you will hear words of support for debate from a number of civic and community leaders, including Justice Carlos Moreno, Judge of the United States Circuit Court for the Central District of California. Justice Moreno previously served as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of California and served as counsel with IRL and Manila after retirement from the bench. We'll also have Judge Paul Wofford, who serves as Circuit Judge, U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Judge Wofford previously prosecuted a wide range of criminal cases as Assistant U.S. Attorney in the Major Fraud Section of the Criminal Division of the Central District of California. Since 2012, Judge, Judge Watford has served as treasurer and board member of Neighborhood Legal Services of Los Angeles County, where he provides pro bono legal services. Judges Moreno and Watford will be joined by panelists, including Lambda board members, community leaders, and others who support Lambda's work to bring debate to public high schools in Los Angeles. Next, I would like to personally thank Massey and Gale as the exclusive presenting sponsor of iResolve. The firm's commitment to debate and not all in particular is both longstanding and astounding. We could not do this work without their support. And so we thank you for believing in us and our mission and committing to supporting tonight's program. Finally, I'm excited to welcome to the virtual stage, Arnie Duncan, former U.S. Secretary of Education and Managing Partner at Emerson Collective. Mr. Duncan has agreed graciously to meet with our four debaters who represent the Los Angeles Metropolitan Debate League. So uh, this is a special opportunity for our students and I appreciate Mr. Duncan uh, setting aside a few moments of, of his time in lieu of remarks to actually engage with our students, which is why we're here today. They have a lot to say about the topic of criminal justice re reform. And I think you'll find this evening that they have committed tremendously to studying and preparing for a meaningful discussion. So with that, I welcome to the virtual stage, Arnie Duncan. Thanks so much, Rhonda. Thanks for all of your leadership. And I think if we need some help on the tech side, or rather than me giving some long, boring speech that nobody wants to hear, um, we'd love to have some questions from our young people. And while we wait for them, we'll just say quickly just how extraordinarily proud I am of our debaters. Such a critically important skill. We need your leadership. We need your critical thinking ability. We need your teamwork. We need your problem solving ability. And this topic is one that's near and dear to my heart. I'm working very hard to try and reduce gun violence here in Chicago. And our black and brown communities here have been decimated by mass incarceration. So really thinking about criminal justice reform um, and how we can do something better uh, for everybody um, is so so unbelievably important to, to bringing some some stability um, to our to our communities that have been socially distanced long before that was a term for decades. So I'll, I'll be quiet. Uh, anybody, I see I see all of our all of our students on. I see Dana first. Maybe I'll just start with you, Dana. Any question you have for me? And you guys feel free to ask anything personally, professionally. Nothing's off limits. So fire away. So you, you go ahead, Dana. 
Thank you. Um, my question is actually about public education. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts are about the role of public education in preparing students to be like actively engaged citizens. Well, I think this is a time, and I, I, will, I have to give a give a, a public service announcement here. Please, please, please vote if you're old enough to vote. If you're not old enough, if you're not old enough to vote, help other folks register. Do whatever you can to participate in our democracy. But public education, for it to be relevant, for it to be meaningful, for you to be inspired to come to school every single day, it has to be connected to the real world, and solving real world problems, um, understanding your role not in just participating in our democracy, which is fine, important, but in actually shaping our democracy, we need your leadership. We need your generation's leadership. And so the more is just a part of our, uh, you know, it's part of education, whether it's high school, middle school, elementary school, um, learning not just what the three branches of government are, <laughs> not just memorizing some facts and some dates and some figures, but how this democracy has to be a living and breathing thing. And I'm always very, very honest. Um, this is my personal opinion. People can agree or disagree. Happy to talk it through. Um, I have honestly in my lifetime never been so scared for our democracy. And the only way I know how to preserve it, things that I thought were rock solid feel unbelievably shaky right now. And for us to preserve our democracy for your generation and ultimately for your children and for your grandchildren, um, we have to engage, we have to participate. And for me, that's gotta be a bedrock of what we do um, in, in, in education across the country. Thank you. Um, and go and feel free to follow if you need, if you want to. Um, Amina, go to you next, if that's okay. Hi, Mr. Duncan, how are you? So my question- Good evening, I'm doing great, thank you. <laughs> so my question today is I've noticed, well, I've read that you worked closely with, um, where you were nominated by Barack Obama. And how was it working closely with him? Uh, it was a dream come true. <laughs> it was an amazing experience. It was hard. It was difficult. I would do it all again in a heartbeat. It was really interesting that he and I had, um, we sort of went back a long ways. Uh, he, Michelle's, uh, his wife, Michelle Obama, her older brother, Craig Robinson, was one of my good friends growing up here playing basketball on the south side of Chicago. So the first time I got to know President Obama, that was Craig's little sister's boyfriend. That's what I knew him as. And uh, we played some basketball together, got to know each other. And then when he was in the Illinois legislature and then the Illinois senator, we visited schools together. We did a lot of sort of policy work together. And I just knew what a heart he had for education. And uh, you know, he, um, had, he made some mistakes as a young person growing up in Hawaii. He was obviously extraordinarily bright, but Hawaii was a, was a very forgiving environment. And he could, you know, he could learn from those mistakes and do okay. Michelle and Craig, unbelievably strong family amazing parents, but they were both first generation college goers. So this was an issue that was very, very personal, both of them. It wasn't just an issue in their heads, it was in their hearts. So you know, this may sound funny, but I, I had no dream of becoming the secretary of education. I'm a public schools, I'm a Chicago boy. I was really, really happy to keep doing it. I didn't go to DC for a, a fancy title, whatever. I went because I believed in President Obama and I wanted to be a part of his team. And I knew how hard he would work to improve educational opportunity, whether it's early childhood for babies, raising, you know, trying to raise graduation rates for high school students your age, or we put $30 billion into Pell Grants to make college more affordable. I knew how hard he would work. So it was just, it was honestly a dream come true. And the fact, which is a rare thing, that we had a, a personal relationship, we had a friendship, um, made it that much more special. And to you know, my kids were little, his daughters were young at that time. They're all grown up a little bit, but sort of have our families grow up together during that time. It's just absolutely amazing. I wouldn't, tra I wouldn't trade it for the world. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Brianna? Um, hi, my question is, what, are, what do you think um, is a key moment in your career or educational life that has gotten you to where you are today? Well, first, I always want to be real honest with, with uh, you guys and everyone that I've made a lot of mistakes. I've failed a lot, of, a lot of times in my life. So I just want to start with that. And um, you can't be afraid to, to mis you know, make a mistake. You can't be afraid to fail. I would say if you're not failing a little bit, you're probably not trying hard enough. You're not stretching yourself. So what I will say, what I've always tried to do is I've always seen my job is to fight for kids and to fight to create opportunity. Um, I've always tried to have mentors 
who would tell me the truth, who would tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. Is I've tried to build leadership teams. I've tried to bring in really, really diverse teams of people with lots of different backgrounds, experiences, and I have some strengths, but I have a lot of weaknesses too. So you want people around you where your weaknesses are their strengths and you can learn together. And I always think diversity makes you better, makes your decisions better. better. So we would have lots of tough you know, policy conversations and debates, but I always thought we walked out of the room smarter and making the right decisions uh, for the right reasons. So I, I wouldn't say there's there's one moment. Um, I grew up as inner city after school tutoring program here in Chicago. She raised my sister and brother and I as a part of the program. What was formative to me was seeing the kids in her program. I called them my after school friends. They were as smart, as committed, as talented, as hardworking, as resilient as my friends during the school day that I went to school with. Had the educational opportunities and that inequity, that imbalance of opportunity, not in talent but in balance of opportunity between my friends during the school day and my afternoon friends, um, that's what shaped my sister and brother and I have all tried to follow in her footsteps. She did that work for 52 years until her health gave out. Unfortunately, she has Alzheimer's now, but just to see the remarkable success she had with so many young people who were born with lots of challenges and lots of different issues, but had people in their life like my mom who believed in them and believed in their potential and pushed them hard every day and loved them every day. That's, I think, been the driving force in my life. I know what kids can do when we give them an opportunity. It's up to us as adults to create those opportunities. And that's, that's what I've tried to do all my life. Thanks. Uh, and Andrew, I think last question for you. And those are good questions. No pressure, but those are good questions. Holy cow. Oh, yeah. OK. Um, so when you were a secretary of education, you pushed for a common core. And I was curious now that common core is pretty much in every school. Uh, would you still support that push for it? Yeah, it's, it's, that's a great, great final question. These are all fantastic questions. Just want to thank you guys for your thoughtfulness. So for me, it's a little complicated, but what I always want to have is high standards. I want to make sure that when you guys graduate from high school, that you can go to college and take college level classes, not take remedial classes. And we talk about college being too expensive. It is, but as a country, we spend about $9 billion each year with a B, $9 billion for high school graduates to go to college and take remedial classes. And that's not fair to you, to your families, to taxpayers, that's not fair to anyone. So our goal was just having a common high set of standards across the country, where if you graduate from your high school, if you're in Texas, you go to the University of Texas. If you're in LA, you could go to UCLA. If you're in you know, Chicago, you could go to the University of Illinois, whatever it might be, you could go there and take college level classes to start and not waste time and money in remedial classes. So it was a little bit controversial, the things we could do differently or better and some, some lessons learned. But at the end of the day, I think when we, when we dummy standards down for, for you guys, and we don't expect enough of you, um, that doesn't do anyone any favors. And I just know how smart, I know how, work, how hardworking kids are across the country. One of the blessings of my job was being able to travel to all 50 states and see hundreds and hundreds of different schools. And it was, it was like, like tonight, it was beyond inspiring. And so I just want you guys, if you work hard, to know that you can go on to uh, go on to college and, and use that use that tuition money, use your grants, use your loans um, to pay for college classes, not to take high school classes again. And my, my, my last, before I close and, and introduce Nick, my last uh, plea is that for all of you, it's so critically important that you graduate from high school, but that's us, that's got to be just one step on your education journey. That can't be the end. And whether it's a four-year university whether it's a two-year community college, trade, technical, vocational training, whatever it might be, some form of education beyond high school has to be the goal for every single one of you. And so this is the, the leadership skills you're gaining, the study habits you're gaining, the camaraderie, the teamwork. Um, I just think you guys are going to do exceptionally well going forward. Um, I wish you all the best on this. I wish I could, uh, you know, we could all do this sort of uh, physically rather than virtually. <laughs> Um, but I've just been so impressed for so many years with, with the debate program. I truly think you guys are nation's future leaders and we need your leadership now more than ever. So good, best of luck. Keep working hard. So proud of you. And anything I can do on your education leadership journeys to be helpful, um, just know um, I'm all in. Uh, and again, thanks for some fantastic, really, really thoughtful questions. I'll stop there and introduce um, a, a good friend, Nick Melvon, who runs the, the LA uh, board. And people might not quite understand. First, LA is the second largest school district in America. Uh, we talk about leadership. 
There are many ways to serve. One is being sort of part of a, a staff, and I ran the Chicago Public Schools, but I had a board that I reported to. And Nick in L.A., so as a young leader, the decision he and his other board members make every single day affect the education of, I don't know the exact number, but something around you know, 700,000 children um, across LA. And public service is, is not easy. Um, it's hard, it's difficult, there's lots of pressure, there's lots of drama, but having people like Nick and so many of his colleagues um, step up to the plate and say, we wanna be part of the answer. Um, we wanna create good governance. We wanna create a great framework in which the superintendent and principals and teachers and administrators and everyone can be successful. Um, the only time you see big urban school districts have success over time is when you have stability and good leadership at the top. Um, I was so blessed to have that here in Chicago. Um, I wasn't I was never lucky enough to have, have Nick as my boss, but I think having folks like him being willing to do this, the governance part of this, um, it's the only way, that, that's sort of it's the only way you're going to have long-term success and stability. So Nick, I want to thank you for your leadership. I want to thank you for your courage and I'm thrilled to turn the stage over to you. Well, thank you, Secretary Duncan, for that kind introduction. It's not every day you get introduced by a former cabinet official. And I'll say uh, to our students as well, when I was in law school, I was an intern in the Obama White House and had the opportunity to hear from then uh, Secretary Duncan. And it really inspired my career path, as I'm sure it will inspire uh, those students who just uh, had the chance to ask some great questions. So thank you again for that introduction, for your inspiring words to our students, and for all your work in support of students in schools uh, now and throughout your career. Um, and thank you to Henry Weissman for the kind inv invitation to participate in this evening's debate. And I'm just here for a few minutes on behalf of Los Angeles Unified School District. Uh, and as Secretary Duncan was mentioning, the second largest district in the country, uh, nearly 700,000 students. Uh, and we're grateful for the partnership to the Los Angeles Metropolitan Debate League in making such a positive impact in our schools. LM LAMDL supports our local schools to build sustainable policy debate programs and cultivate great debaters and students. Debaters have higher rate of high school graduation, which was so important, but just a prerequisite for higher education, as the secretary mentioned, but nearly 100% of high school debaters through LMDL graduate from high school. Debaters score significantly higher in reading, English, and science, and debaters become leaders. 63% of Congress were former debaters. And tonight, we have four talented debaters who you've already heard from, and I think you can learn a lot from the questions somebody asks. And I see that every day in my job with my colleagues on the Board of Education. We had a long board meeting today. Uh, and based on the questions from these students for Secretary Duncan, I think we have some sharp students on our hands. The past few weeks of national debates have mostly shown us what not to do. Uh, and I'm sure tonight's participants will set a much better model of how to have a civil, productive, and substantive debate. So I'm gonna introduce or reintroduce, I should say, our four debaters. Two of them will join the stage in a minute um, and you'll see and hear from the others later. So Brianna Viatoro is a junior at STEAM Legacy High School. She's interested in majoring in pre-law or engineering. I'd encourage her to major in both um, as she leads us into the future. Andrew Subingsabing is a junior at Dr. Richard A. Vladovic Harbor Teacher Preparation Academy, and his career aspiration is to be a lawyer, and I think he's come to the right place for that. Uh, Dana Agbeed is a senior at Downtown Magnets High School, and she plans on majoring in public, public policy and economics, and it sounds like someone is eager to solve our public pension crisis, and so I'm grateful for that. Uh, and Amina Reyes is a senior at New Designs Charter School, University Park, and she aspires to be an immigration or employment lawyer, both admirable and sadly very necessary career paths these days. So best of luck to you all. I look forward to voting for you all someday. And in the meantime, look forward to hearing you debate. Uh, and thank you again to LMDL for your partnership on behalf of a very grateful school district. Good evening. My name is Brenda Toro, and I'm a junior at STEAM Legacy High School. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to be here today. To begin, I'd like to define an important term of this debate. Plea bargaining is when prosecutors present the opportunity to the defendant to plead guilty in exchange for a theoretically more favorable outcome. Plea bargain cases began to appear in the appellate courts during the Civil War, and during the 20th century, the 20th century brought with it a spike in popularity, making it a standard practice in many jurisdictions, though it was still thought of as unethical or sometimes even illegal. Today, I will highlight three ways that plea bargaining has led to harm in our community. 
First, plea bargaining has led to prosecutors gaining more power, which they have abused to incentivize guilty pleas. Second, it has become a weapon of deportation. Finally, plea bargains contribute to racial disparities. Because of these issues, we propose that we have a mandatory judge or arbiter intervention during plea bargaining. Plea bargains give too much autonomy to prosecutors who may easily coerce the defendant into accepting a plea deal, even when there's not enough evidence for a conviction. During plea bargains, defendants don't get to hear witness statements, and they do not understand how much evidence or lack thereof can be used to convict them that can be used to convict them if they do go to trial. Prosecutors have been known to threaten unreasonably high charges to pressure defendants into accepting plea deals. Gretchen Gavin, editor of Harvard Business Review, states, Plea bargaining is more often than not used to save money and time. Many cannot risk the chance to be in jail for an extended period of time if found guilty, and this can lead an innocent person to plead guilty. An example of the situation would be Emra Faye Stewart. She and 27 others were arrested for allegedly participating in a drug ring. She told her lawyer she was innocent and had two children at home. Emra was advised to plead guilty and was sentenced to 10 years with probation when she took the deal. It was later discovered that her accuser had lied, and while other cases were dismissed, those who had pled guilty were left with charges on their record. The coercion also affects non-citizens specifically. Sean Musgraves of Stanford Law and Brooke Williams of Boston University found that an examination of court records and other documents suggest that federal prosecutors are increasingly likely to man plea bargains in which non-citizens sign away due, right, due process rights. Donna Lee Elm, a public defender in Middle District, Florida, stated, they're using the threat of prosecution to give up rights in an immigration case. In some cases, immigrants charged with crimes were coerced into signing a plea agreement in which they have to promise no present fear of torture upon returning to their home country, which would prevent them from seeking asylum and protection from prosecution in the future. Plea bargaining has also led to numerous racial disparities. A study from Carlos Berdejo of Loyola Law School found significant racial disparities in plea in plea deals that suggest that prosecutors may be using race as a proxy for criminality. Prosecutors um, prosecutors can be subject to implicit bias with limited information, time, and resources. The study, a study over a seven-year period, found that white defendants were 25% more likely than black defendants to have their most serious initial charge dropped or reduced to a less severe charge. Black defendants were more likely than white defendants to be convicted of their highest initial charge. There are ways to address these issues. According to Daniel S. McConkie of Stanford Law, one of, plea bargaining, one of plea bargaining's key infirmities is that it largely excludes judges until the tail end of the process. Plea bargaining discussions are conducted largely on a basis of what parties believe judges would do at sentencing, but judges have no early opportunity to dispel them of any misconceptions. We propose that judges or arbiters facilitate the bargaining process and organize the opening and closing of the bargaining process. We would re they would remain neutral during the negotiation and serve as a second source of information to better inform depend defendants about what may happen if they do go to trial. Jojo arbiter intervention can also lead to prosecutors being more forthcoming with their cases. Several states already encourage judicial intervention when negotiating deals such as New York, Arizona, Idaho, North Carolina, Massachusetts, Oregon, Minnesota, Montana, and Vermont. Mandatory judge intervention can overall improve fairness of plea bargains. Thank you for your time. Okay, in your speech, you say that Black defendants are most likely to get the highest sentence possible. If this is true, why are plea bargains the culprit, and how would adding a third party solve this issue? I think that evidence you're referring to um, is when I say white defendants are 25% more likely than Black defendants to have their most serious initial charge dropped or reduced, and Black defendants are more likely than white defendants to be convicted of their highest initial charge. Um, this piece of evidence is specifically referring to the negotiation of a defendant's charge, so the outcome is specific to plea bargains. And having a third party present during negotiations would help solve this issue by allowing um, a neutral party to supervise the opening and closing of negotiations to prevent prosecutorial coercion. Okay, yeah. Um, next question. So in the sentencing process, things like mandatory minimums allow for prosecutors to go for extremely high sentences. So in the defendant's eyes, what difference does it make uh, that plea bargains have a third party prosecutor or like a third party if prosecutors are still able to put them away for decades through, through things like a mandatory minimum? Correcting the issues within the plea bargaining system specifically would make a huge difference in the def um, to the defendants because most cases don't make it to trial and do end in plea bargains. Um, threats of overcharging and oversentencing could still be around, like even if mandatory minimums were done away with. And the way our proposal disrupts this pattern would be like through the third party interrupting coercion and in and um, ensuring a fair bargain. Okay, cool. Um, if racial biases are a part of a bigger issue within the criminal justice system, how do we ensure that biases won't manifest somewhere else in the sentencing process? 
racial biases can and have manifested themselves in other parts of the criminal justice system. Um, and completely eliminating these biases is something that no singular policy can really do. Um, but what's important here is to make the process fair and plea bargaining should be prioritized within like while trying to achieve this goal because 90 to like 95 percent of the ca of cases end in plea bargaining. Hi, my name is Andrew Subing Subing, and today I will be talking about mandatory minimum sentencing. Mandatory minimum sentencing requires automatic minimum prison time for certain crimes. Mandatory minimum sentencing was a law instituted by Congress in 1986 as part of the Anti-Drug Abuse Act. These laws have their roots in the war on drugs, which was a racist political campaign that didn't seek to stop the use of drugs, but instead sought to put people of color behind bars. While plea bargains have impacted people in our community, we believe fixing them does not acknowledge the bigger issue within the sentencing process. Today, we will highlight three, three ways mandatory minimum sentencing is actually the issue that we must prioritize and eliminate. First, mandatory minimums overly punish individuals who commit nonviolent crimes. Second, mandatory minimums are racially biased. And third, even if a judge recognizes these issues and wants to give a more fair sentence, they must rule based on the law and not their own expertise. As a solution, we propose eliminating mandatory minimum sentencing in drug-related cases. Point one is overly harsh punishments. For the most part, drug-related offenses are often nonviolent and usually extend to the and usually extend to the possession or selling of drugs. Mandatory minimums have resulted in overly harsh punishments, which for which for what are relatively minute offenses. The most common type of offenses in drug-related mandatory minimums are trafficking and selling drugs. Examples of when mandatory minimums would be required are if you had 28 grams of crack cocaine that would warrant a five-year sentence and if you had a prior drug conviction that number doubles to 10 years another outrageous minimum is just 10 grams of lsd will result in 20 years in prison for those who say that this punishment fits the crime i ask you to reflect on just how long 20 years really is what were you doing 20 years ago are you really the same person now and can you honestly say that your decision making has stayed constant while you while you may think these sentences are based on a fair scale, the number of years that correlates to each crime is completely arbitrary and decided almost randomly. There's no science or coherent reason why Congress decided these crimes deserve a minimum in the first place, nor why these minimums should be so high. An unfortunate example of this situation is the case of Atiba Parker, who was sentenced to 42 years in prison for selling less than three ounces of crack. Point two is racial disparities. As if these outrageous numbers were not bad enough, there is substantial data showing that mandatory minimum sentencing are racially biased and tend to affect people of color, but especially black men more than anyone else. Before the extensive effect of mandatory minimum sentencing had taken hold, the average sentence for black people was 93% higher than that of whites. After mandatory minimum sentencing was instituted, the Minnesota Sentencing Commission reported that the number of black people arrested for drug violations increased by 500%, while the rate for whites increased by only 30%. Current estimates suggest that 50% of all black men will spend some time in prison and mandatory minimums are undoubtedly a contributor to the startling statistic. The, the discrepancy in sentencing isn't because black people are inherently more likely to use drugs. Rather, laws like mandatory minimum senti sentences more severely punish drugs that are more commonly used by Black people. For example, we can compare, and we can compare the punishments between crack cocaine and powder cocaine. At its core, these are the same drugs, but crack is more predominantly used by black drug users and powder is more predominantly used by white drug users. Now, if the law was fair, these drugs would have similar punishments. But what we find instead is, is crack is punished with a ratio of 100, of 100 to 1, while cocaine is punished with a ratio of 18 to 1. Point three is politics overrides justice. Even if a judge wanted to sentence a defendant in a more fair way, mandatory minimums take away their discretionary power and require certain sentences to be hounded down based on the crime the defendant is found guilty of. Our proposal. The three points presented prove that we should do away with mandatory minimum sentencing in drug-related offenses in favor of a more reasonable and less biased sentencing system that doesn't subject people to decades in prison for relatively minute crimes. While reforming plea bargains may make pretrial process fair, we believe people take plea bargains to avoid a very hard, the very harsh punishments required by mandatory minimums. Getting rid of mandatory minimums is the obvious choice because it takes away the leverage for prosecutors have when trying to force defendants to take plea bargains. Our solution allows for the judge to make trials as a whole fair and not just the pretrial process. Okay. Um, is there still important is there still an importance to mandatory minimums even if a case doesn't make it to trial? Uh yeah, I definitely think that mandatory minimums are still important because uh we think that mandatory minimums are the reasons why defendants take plea bargains because prosecutors 
sort of dangle these uh, outrageous numbers above defendants' heads. They feel scared to take their case to trial and instead opt for a plea bargain, which is less years than a mandatory minimum would require them to have. Prosecutors would still be able to threaten unreasonable charges and sentences. How does removing mandatory minimums change the prosecutor's incentive or how does it alter this pattern? Yeah, so right now, how we think mandatory minimums operate is sort of as like a cushion for prosecutors to get to say, oh, this is what we have to go for. And so they get to kind of skirt the obvious racial bias. But if we're able to remove mandatory minimums, they won't have this cushion to kind of point their fingers at. And instead, they'll, they'll sort of spotlight the prosecutors that still go for ridiculously high numbers and they won't be able to blame something else and they'll have to take culpability. Um, the First Step Act made reforms to the three strike rule and reduced um, the sentencing disparity between crack and powder p- cocaine. Um, were these reforms sufficient? Why or why not? Yeah, I definitely would say that the First Step Act wasn't sufficient. While we think it's a it's a step in the right direction, uh, criminal justice reform is uh, it's a game of inches, not miles. So. Uh, things like uh, the first step, the first step act got rid of things like life sentences, but it still keeps 25 years, which is um, a ridiculously high number. Also, it's not retroactive, which would which means that people who are um, who are in jail because of mandatory mandatory minimums now won't be able to get out, even though the law says that they don't need a 25 year minimum. Um, we both have the understanding that there's like, realistically a finite amount of change that can take place at a moment. Um, why would the government have motives to alter sentencing again so recently? Um, because it's the right thing to do. I think that, um, you know, there is not really a stop for criminal justice, especially in the world we're living today, right? Even if you know, we decide that plea bargains are a good thing to do now, there's no reason that mandatory minimums aren't also a good thing to do now. Good evening. Uh, My name is Justice Carlos uh, Moreno. I'm a uh, product of uh, the LAUSD uh, school system. I grew up here in Los Angeles and central uh, Los Angeles and still live in central Los Angeles. Uh, I've been practicing law for about 45 years, hard to believe. 25 of those years were as a judge here at Los Angeles County. And the last uh, 10 years on the court with the California Supreme Court. And like the Secretary Duncan and uh, Mr. Melvin, uh, I'm also a product of uh, the Obama administration. Uh, The last uh, three years uh, of the Obama administration, I served as the United States ambassador uh, to uh, Belize. Now as a trial judge, I'm very well familiar with the two issues that both of you have, have described plea bargaining and mandatory sentencing. So uh, I have a lot of experience in that those areas of the law, as well as in death penalty cases and so many other uh, cases. Uh, I want to commend you uh, for your presentations. It's obvious to me that you put in a lot of time and effort and research in being able to formulate Uh, your arguments uh, this evening. I think debate, as Secretary uh, Arne indicated, uh, I think it's a really great skill to have. I know a number of you are interested in in becoming lawyers, becoming uh, advocates. So the skills that you've demonstrated tonight, I think will serve you well should you choose law as a career. And I hope that you ultimately do that. I've heard hundreds, if not thousands of cases and hundreds of thousands of of oral advocates. And you're right up there with the advocates that I've seen in all the courts in which I've served. So I know that uh, as you continue with this debate experience and go on to college, uh, that in your own time, in your own way, and in your own right, uh, you will be a success. Uh, you too, in your own field, can become a Mookie Betts or a LeBron James or some other star athlete, but I look forward to seeing each of you uh, becoming stars in the field of oral advocacy. I'd prefer that you go into the law, but I think oral advocacy, as you've demonstrated tonight, can really serve you well in whatever career uh, you choose. Uh, 
Uh, now I have <clears throat> the privilege of a judges panel who I'm sure listened attentively to your arguments. They're gonna have some, some comments. Uh, try to have a dialogue with them. Uh, I know them, uh, they're friendly people, uh, but I think they're gonna have some constructive comments about your uh, presentations uh, tonight. Uh, the first judge will be Craig Kirkwood. He's a former criminal defense lawyer, I'm told. He now works for the LA County Counsel's Office uh, representing the Department of Health Services. You'll also have as a judge, Kira Johal, and she is an entertainment lawyer. She worked at NBC University uh, Media Company. So she would have some insights into your presentations. And finally, you're gonna hear from uh, Jeff uh, Kawatanitz. He's actually a business partner of Ice Cube. You must know who that is. And also the CEO of a company called The Firm and Three. So I'm gonna ask them to uh, come on board and excuse myself, but great presentation and have fun above all. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, uh, initially, let, let me just give you the opportunity to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Craig Kirkwood. I am an attorney uh, with the Office of County Counsel. I've been an attorney for approximately 12 years. I was a trial attorney with the Public Defender's Office for about 11 years. But this is, in fact, my second career. Uh, my first career was an actor. I was an actor for about 15 years. And the only thing that people would probably know me from is Remember the Titans. I was Rev in Remember the Titans. I ran the touchdown at the end of the movie. Uh, that was about 20 years and 30 pounds ago. But that was definitely me. So uh, I was also in speech and debate as a high schooler. Uh, I did humor interp, dramatic interp, Lincoln Douglas, student congress, and uh, extemporaneous speaking. So I want to let you know that the skills that you acquire during this time period will serve you for the rest of your life. Uh, as someone who's taken at least 50 uh, trials to verdict, uh, the the most terrifying thing for most people is public speaking. So if you can overcome that, uh, everything else is a, a walk in the park. So if I may, uh, I'd like to direct my first question to Ms. Villatoro. Uh, initially, uh, I want to commend you on uh, the depth of the research. Uh, I want to uh, indicate that your uh, analysis was right on point and you will fit in very well into the IRAC uh, of law school. IRAC is essentially issue rule analysis conclusion. That's how law school exams work. But having practiced criminal defense uh, for over a decade, uh, I'm very familiar with the plea bargaining process that you discussed. So the question for you that I have is with respect to judicial intervention. You indicated that that was one of uh, the ways by which to level the playing field with respect to plea bargaining. But in my experience, I have found statistically that most judges on the bench are prior prosecutors. And there is something in place uh, with respect to plea bargaining called pleading open to the court where you can subvert an offer that's given by the district attorney's office in order to possibly get a better deal for your client. But I have found in my experience that oftentimes uh, the DA and the judge are basically on the same page. So what do you do or what do you suggest, Ms. Villatoro, to uh, avoid and disincentivize judicial advocacy from the bench? How do we keep the playing field even and keep our judges neutral? Um, in terms of keeping judges neutral, um, of course, some um, judges may be subject to biases, um, just like most humans are. Um, but this is also um, why within our proposal, we also have a suggestion for arbiter intervention. So um, in case you feel like um, your judge isn't necessarily like um, completely neutral, there is an opportunity to have an arbiter. Um, Would that arbiter be like a mediator? Would that be a like mediation <laughs> essentially? Okay. Mm -hmm. And do you propose that the defendant stays in custody during this process? Um, Good to question, extent, right? <laughs> um, to that extent, our proposal mainly focuses on the um, 
the idea of plea bargaining within itself. So um, in terms of like where the defendant is before trial or during the bargaining process, um, that's not something that our proposal really addresses. Um, our proposal mm-hmm. mainly addresses what's going on um, during the bargaining, act of bargaining itself. Thank you. That was an excellent answer to my question. And I just have one more uh, question for you, very briefly. Uh, You indicated that during the plea bargain process, the defendant is not allowed to hear evidence and witnesses against him. Uh, In my experience, that has not been the case. More often than not, a defendant does have the opportunity to review the discovery uh, proffered to the defense attorney in an effort to basically understand if a plea bargain is advisable. So with that additional information, does that change your point of view? Um, I still don't think it changes the um, point of view because there is still like that intent to um, overcharge or over sentence on like the prosecutor's behalf, even if the defendant were to have like um, a clear understanding of like all the evidence that is presented, they might not understand to the extent in which that evidence is important or like imperial to like um, the case itself. Ms. Villatoro, thank you so much. That was a very cogent and persuasive answer. So thank you. Uh, I've got another question for Mr. Sabing Sabing. Sir, initially, I want to let you know that your speech was fantastic. Very nicely done. However, uh, I do do want to encourage you uh, with a note that I got from every stenographer in every courtroom I was ever in. Slow down. Because when you're trying to be persuasive, the information has to be absorbed. I have to hear you. You've done your speech a hundred billion times, my friend. This is the first time that we've heard it. So in order for us to fully absorb the poignancy of what you're saying, take your time. Yeah. Inflection and introspection, give those pauses gives you the time to allow your words to sink in. So now my question with respect to your issue is, Your optimism with respect to mandatory minimums is admirable. However, how do you propose to address the systemic harm that that possession for sale of Schedule I drugs inflicts on specifically our communities? Yeah, um, I would definitely say that there isn't one one answer for systemic issues, things like, you know, the obvious systemic racism within our country. I think that that's a massive issue that needs to be grappled in many different ways and in many different forms. I think that um, getting rid of mandatory minimums in the context of drug cases is just one of those ways in order to tackle uh, the the systemic issues that we're facing right now. Well, I appreciate that very much. Uh, And I also want to commend you on the depth of your research and the cogent nature of your persuasive speech. Um, One, let's see. So, one last question and then I'll leave you go. I'll let you go. How does your plan tackle recidivism? Recidivism deals with the gentlemen, the folks that unfortunately find themselves in the penal system over and over and over again. So how do you propose to deal with that, sir? Yeah, I think I would think that uh, mandatory minimums um, in the context of things like drugs is uh, a contributor to recidivism, right? Uh, petty petty uh, drug offenses where you have an ounce of weed on you and then you find yourself in uh, getting arrested again. I think that um, uh, I, I think that a mandatory minimum definitely isn't the answer to just put him in jail forever, right? And then we don't got to keep re-arresting you. I think that um, that the focus of my plan isn't to necessarily, you know, not find disenfranchised community back in prison. That's, I think that's more of a policing issue, right? Where we put police and who police target. But I think that um, definitely saying, well, we're going to catch you again. So might as well just keep you in there for 20 years isn't the answer. And I think that instead we need to uh, to tackle an issue like rec- recidivism. We need to focus uh, on police reform. Thank you so much. Uh, I genuinely appreciate your answers and I'm looking forward to seeing what your generation will do with this giant ball of dirt we call the earth. So thank you for that, sir. I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Joel now. Thank you, Craig. Uh, I just wanna echo Craig's sentiments. I know we'll be giving you both more feedback at the end of this process, but you both did a fantastic job. 
not to mention the circumstances we're in now of not only having to perfect your debates, but also doing it in a virtual environment at home, which I actually think is more challenging in a lot of ways. So congratulations to you both. I would like to, um, I'll briefly tell you a little bit about myself as well. And then I've got one question for each of you. Um, so as Judge Moreno spoke about, uh, I am an employment attorney at NBC Universal. I am probably relatively young compared to some of the other attorneys that are joining us here today. I'm six years out of law school um, and actually started my practice in private practice, but spent a lot of time in law school working with um, a clinic we had at my law school, as well as our local ACLU organization and their prisoners rights project, um, working on some of these uh, challenging consequences of mass incarceration and, you know, had the opportunity to actually go to Rikers Island, which I went to law school in New York, um, and, and engage with some of the community there. And to Mr. Subing, Subing's points in his speech, see a lot of the community that you were speaking about um, affected by these mandatory minimum laws and many of whom were drug offenders. Um, I will guess I'll go ahead and start with you, uh, Mr. Subing Subing. You had mentioned as your first point in your debate that one of the consequences of these mandatory minimums is that they overly punish nonviolent offenders. Curious about why you draw the line at drug related cases only. Why not go further than that um, and extend it to all nonviolent offenders or even, even beyond that if these mandatory minimums do create some of the racially racial biases and other disadvantages that you spoke about? Yeah, so um, obviously mandatory minimums um, encompass a lot of different crimes. Um, unfortunately, you know, my speech is limited to four minutes, so I only have so much time to talk about uh, so many different things. Uh, I pulled uh, in my speech, I talk about three different points, three different issues um, I find with mandatory minimums just in the context of, you know, drug related cases. And um, there's, a, you know, that double more that I could have talked about given I had enough time to. I think that there is definitely reform to be done in other areas uh, within mandatory minimums and outside of mandatory minimums. But uh, I just think the uh, constraint uh, time I have for my speech is one of the reasons. But um, another reason is just uh, uh, research, right? Like there's so much to talk about, there's so much to learn about. And I really just wanted to focus on, um, on drug related issues. And I know I said I would just ask one question, but given how informed I can tell that you are about the issue, I'm going to ask one follow up with that. Um, you know, uh, I took note of your three points, and I think you both did a great job of outlining those at the beginning of each of your debates. Um, in the argument with respect to uh, supporting eliminating those mandatory minimums, uh, Mr. Subing Subing, are there any financial ramifications that you came across that you could speak to in terms of you know, what that would contribute. I know that, you know, there's been increased budgets and uh, costs of our increasingly large prison population here in the United States, especially over the past decade. Um, was that something you thought about at all in terms of, of costs and, and, and that benefit of eliminating the mandatory minim minimums as well? Um, if you don't mind me asking, when you say um, costs, and what, what are you referring to? Like cost per Meaning if we um, lessen our prison population, uh, you know, and, and bring those costs down for society. So maybe individuals who are, don't find uh, the other arguments you made as compelling as I do, is there a, is there a cost benefit to lowering our prison population? Most certainly. Um, uh, um, before mandatory minimums were instituted, um, like, like I say in my speech, um, or sorry, after mandatory minimums were instituted, the uh, the rate of incarceration for uh, black folks went up by 500%, right? And so that is obviously a startling number. Also, after mandatory minimums were instituted, one in 100 adults um, were incarcerated in America. Um, so I think I think that you know saving that money on prison population and not having somebody in jail for 20 years definitely is a um, a financial benefit that we can then, you know, redirect to things like educational programs like debate, right? Um, I, b I believe the number is something about fifty-six thousand dollars for uh, to hold a prisoner every year, and obviously that isn't a um, light number, right? Fifty-six thousand dollars is a lot of money. It's more than some families make a whole year. So I think that there definitely is a uh, financial benefit to uh, getting rid of mandatory minimums. Great, thank you. 
Um, Ms. Viatoro, my question for you, I know in the initial point that you made about supporting your position, you noted that there's um, a lot of power that is given to prosecutors and, and taking the stance that you did would eliminate some of that. For those who would argue and maybe place some emphasis on the role of a defense attorney or a DA, a public defender, excuse me, um, and say that maybe it's th them who should serve the role as being sort of a mediator or arbitrator in these plea bargaining situations. Um, you know, they're likely to be less biased possibly than, than an arbitrator or a judge or someone else, given that they have the interests of their clients in mind. Um, what would your response be to, to that, to the, to the defense attorney or the public defender taking on that role um, in the plea bargaining process? Um, one of the key reasons why I specifically advocated for um, including judges within this process was because um, plea bargains are con plea bargaining and plea bargaining like discussions are conducted like largely on a basis of what parties believe judges would do at sentencing and um, judges really don't have an early opportunity to dispel any of those misconceptions. Um, that's why I think it would be um, there. There's a specific value to having a judge um, within like the bargaining process, and I state that in my. Um, McConkie evidence um, during my proposal. That was great. Um, so I, uh, I debated for Marlboro High School in New Jersey, uh, debated my freshman year for Northwestern, went to quarterfinals and nationals and quit, um, and went to Harvard Law. Um, it's great. I was wondering if you guys were going to be talking fast or not, <laughs> but it's... Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's it's refreshing. Um, I just had my pad the wrong direction, so I didn't get to, to do it outright. Um, you know, just my background, I, I started a big entertainment company, uh, the firm. I mean, I managed people from uh, Scorsese and Leonardo you know, DiCaprio and Vin Diesel and Amy Adams to, to Ice Cube, Corn, Lincoln Park, Jennifer Lopez, Michael Jackson, etc. cetera. Um, decided to get into producing so I could be more involved with getting messages out. I always believed entertainment was a great way of actually making reform. It wasn't until I was sitting in a pretty 95% uh, white audience on the opening night of Straight Outta Compton and sitting in the first row just watching back how people were reacting and realized that entertainment really can change people's views and that was a really impactful moment for me um i've worked with ice cube for 25 years um we're partners we came up with this crazy idea for better or for worse to start a basketball league um which is very um athlete friendly um but you know it's uh it's challenging more importantly um this summer after george floyd um we put out Ice Cube and I, a contract with Black America, and it tries, it's an attempt to start raising issues about, you know, a lot of things that need to be done in Black America. We're very focused on the Black-White wealth gap, um, so on economic reform, but we've spent a lot of time on judicial and police reform, so very much appreciate the uh, the topic here, it's super important. Um, so, Brianna, plea bargaining. Um, why are judges better than prosecutors? In my experience, judges tend to be as racially biased and as in desiring, and, and I, I actually, uh, my friend Mark Garagos knows Judge Marino and says he's great, so I hope he's not offended. But, you know, judges like to clean their slate just as much as prosecutors. The difference is prosecutors are judged by their win-loss record. So a plea, they're more likely to go for a plea, perhaps, because they get to call it a win rather than taking a chance in court where a judge doesn't have the same issue. So I guess my question is, given that there's racial bias everywhere, why are judges better 
than prosecutors in making those decisions? Why will it be better? Um, in terms of the um, the plan, the proposal doesn't specifically remove the presence of a prosecutor from the plea bargaining process. Um, the judge is mainly there to um, to to overview the process. Um, since they would have less of an incentive to have a plea bargain because they are not the prosecutor. Um, it's a judge's job to remain neutral, but of course, some may be subject to biases. Um, the important part is just to improve the quality of plea bargaining overall so that the process is fair. And, and having a second party would um, can lead to a prosecutors altering their behaviors um, because there would be a presence that is neutral or is supposed to be neutral. Um, and it could also help to have the defendant be better informed. So right. and judges- also, I, I think I, I understand. I understand that answer. I think it's good. But what do you do about the fact that judges already, you know, cases take three, four years to get to court? How are you going to have even more time to put judges into the into this process? Um, if judges aren't available, there's also an option for arbiters within our um, proposal. So um, that could also like um, be involved within like this process. All right. Let me ask you one last question. What about the problem of defense attorneys? Because a lot in my research, I've seen that a lot of defense attorneys have their own racial biases and don't properly um, represent, you know, they want to get rid of cases too. They want to check the box and go on to the next. How do you deal with defense attorneys who aren't pro properly looking out for their clients? And um, so like what like what I stated, I think that the presence of a judge or an arbiter in this case can also help too, because um, the a neutral presence can like um, help give the defendant a better idea of when they're being um, overcharged or threatened with like an unrealistic sentence or overall just a better of what's going a better idea of what's going on so that they won't be overformed. Um, or ill informed before they make their like decisions. So um, having um, so having a neutral like presence in general can just help the defendant be better informed if the um, prosecutors or the um, defense attorney doesn't necessarily has like biases that are preventing them from having um, a, pro a proper um, deal. Okay. Um, and Craig, I just bring up that question because I know as a good defense attorney, you know how many bad ones there are. <laughs> I do. I do. But I got out of the game. I'm not in the game anymore, Jeff. I got old, sir. It, it wasn't old. into you. <laughs> so, Andrew, um, in your cross-examination of Brianna, you brought up why won't racism show up in other places? So I ask you the same question because I think you're right. Racism is rampant throughout all aspects of the system. So just getting rid of mandatory minimums why will there actually be progress? Because if you're putting, I, I get the idea of giving judges discretion and I believe in it. Theoretic, you know, it may, intellectually it makes sense. But if you believe there's racism per your question throughout the, how, how, how will getting rid of it solve it? Yeah. So why would there be progress? Um, I think, I think there will still be progress, right? Because even though there are bad prosecutors, there has to be some good prosecutors, right? There has to be some not racist prosecutors, right? So even if uh, doing away with mandatory minimums means that a thousand people more a year don't get 20 year sentences, right? And instead get six month sentences or whatever number is fair for the crime they committed. I think that that is a reason why we should, um, I think that that is progress and that is a reason why we should do away with mandatory minimums. Okay. Um, any progress is good. There's no doubt. Um, since you did focus, I know this question came up already, um, but since you focus so heavily on, on drug offenses and it does seem that that's where most of the abuse is, um, especially like you say, you know, with, with crack versus powder cocaine, um, and it did several examples of that. Um, why 
wouldn't you, why isn't a better thing instead of um, tinkering with mandatory minimums, why isn't it better to have drug courts and to divert drug cases? That that might be a um, a great um, solution, or it might help more people. I think that right now, since we don't have drug courts, uh, getting rid of mandatory minimums would be the easier answer because all that would happen is that Congress would have to pass a bill, right? To have drug courts, a lot of things would have to happen, right? Um, it'd be a whole new um, branch of things to get into. So. I think that that could be a long-term goal, right? And that could be something that we strive towards. But um, during my cross-examination, during the cross-examination, I say that criminal justice reform is a game of inches, not miles, right? We can't expect to solve all of racism tomorrow. So I think we should make progress where we can. And right now, I think that's in getting rid of mandatory minimums. Okay. Thank you both. And thank you for doing this. It needs to be, it needs to be examined. And debate is great. And it'll help you for a lot of things in life. You'll be surprised. Yes, thank you so much to all thank of the so panelists. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for um, the questions, the discussion, and your time. Good job. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in tonight. My name is Joseph Flores. I am the program director of the Los Angeles Metropolitan Debate League. Um, next up, we will have uh, questions for the panelists from the audience. So. If you're in the audience and would like to ask questions of our awesome panelists, uh, go ahead and jump to the chat and I will ask those questions. Um, before we move on, I just want to say thank you, Brianna and Andrew, uh, for opening up this debate. The amount of research that you did ahead of time not only shows during your speech, uh, but during the panelists' questions. Um, I, I want to say thank you to the panelists uh, for asking real questions that we really need to answer um, in order to make these reforms and changes happen in the real world. Um, to echo a point that Mr. Duncan made earlier, uh, it's not just enough to learn trivia or facts, um, but it's important to learn how we apply these things that we learn to change the world around us. Um, in debate, that's what we call portable skills. And I think all the debaters tonight um, highlight just how important those skills that they're working on um, will be able to translate into uh, making the world a better place, not just um, for themselves, but for everyone around them. Uh, the clash of this debate will continue shortly with Dana Agbidi and Amina Reyes uh, giving closing remarks. Uh, but while they work with their partner to prepare their final speeches, um, we have a few minutes to get some questions from the audience. I just wanted to start off by asking um, all the panelists the, the same question. Um, but what do you think about the first two speakers? Um, and I know some of you have already spoken on your experience in these fields. Um, but how do you think that these types of reforms would play out in the real world? Um, last time we started with Craig, so I'll start from the other side. Uh, Jeff, if you could start, and we'll circle around backwards. Okay. Um, how do I think these reforms would happen in the real world? I, I, I believe that they're both um, necessary, uh, but certainly not sufficient. Um, I think that we really need a an overall overhaul of our, our justice in prison um, outlook based on the fact that of what they both brought up. You know, they both pointed to racism and, you know, racism goes throughout the entire process. And when you get into the numbers, it, it, it's, it's shocking and it doesn't change. It hasn't changed in hundreds of years. Um, it's gotten worse. You know, while reforming plea bargaining and getting rid of mandatory minimums is certainly necessary, I think we have a, a, should be doing a lot more radical. Awesome. Kira? Is it my turn? Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm with, in agreement with uh, Jeff and sort of my support of both of these positions. I actually think it was Jeffrey that brought this up in his questioning to um, Brianna, I think one of the concerns from the plea bargaining perspective is um, how much of a burden our judges already face with their caseload. So um, while I think the underlying issues that Brianna spoke about in terms of, uh, 
you know, concerns about prosecutors and, and potentially putting too much power in their hands and, and um, some of the racial biases that result, uh, you know, uh, having been uh, in private practice for the past six years and uh, having all my cases in federal and state court, you see that um, our judges are are already quite, I think, overburdened with their caseloads. And so I think there's a practical issue and concern there about whether this could really be implemented. Um, and so, uh, you know, I know that Brianna in her proposal talked about having other arbiters. And so I think it'd be an interesting point to think about where that pool of individuals may come from and whether there's sort of a separate body of people that are established to be um, involved in that process. Um, practically speaking, I don't know that I see that our already our judges can uh, take that on as well. Um, you know, with the mandatory minimums, uh, if it wasn't clear from my questioning, it's uh, uh, Andrew's position is one that I agree with. It's sort of why I opened up with his question about taking taking it even further. Um, but I think as an initial proposal, especially for um, again, I kind of always go towards uh, the practical in terms of what is going to find common ground between people that may view these issues differently. And I think that starting with nonviolent drug offenses was a great tactic of his um, in terms of messaging it and advocating for the issue first on that grounds, um, letting it play out. And then if there's, you know, uh, a, a movement to broaden it later on. Um, that might work better taking it sort of inch by inch as I think he said himself. And Mr. Kirkwood, your perspectives. Thank you so much. Uh, initially, I'd like to commend both speakers uh, for being so persuasive, so well prepared and able to handle uh, the, the most rigorous of cross-examinations. So what I'd like to put, just sort of put forth is that I was on the ground uh, in the trenches for years I handled hardcore felonies in Compton for five years. So I was handling uh, attempted murders between Pyru Bloods and, you know, a bunch of other uh, inner city issues. But I think with respect to plea bargaining, I think it's interesting to note that in Japan, there were no plea bargains until relatively recently. Every case that was filed in Japan had to actually be litigated. And I would indicate that that might actually help considerably. Now, the problem with that would be, how do we deal with what happens in the interim? Because some of these cases take years to bring to trial. Some of my murder cases, it took two, three years before we even tried it. So in the interim, what do you do? But I, you know, we were allowed to actually hold their feet to the fire with respect to what they're charging and actually say, okay, well, if you want to charge all this stuff, get in here and prove it now. Uh, I think the fact that they know that these cases are going to plea down, sometime, I, more often than not, these cases are overcharged. So they'll charge the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker and to scare someone so that when the defense attorney goes in and indicates, hey, your max on this is 125 years, and, they're all, and I'm not being uh, hyperbolic, some of these maxes are 125, 150 years. And you're legitimately talking about decades to a young person who's 22, 23, and you're discussing plea dispositions that contemplate decades. Uh, I, I think that I would really want to see more cases actually be tried. Because I think when you actually put that hot dog on the fire, most of that burns away. But most of these cases are being tried because the system can't handle it. This is not possible. But I do appreciate uh, Ms. Viatoro's uh, point of view, and I want to commend her on her speech. Uh, with respect to Mr. Sabine Sabine, uh, I think that you're also correct with respect to mandatory minimum sentencing. Uh, what I've seen from my colleagues who practice federally is that oftentimes mandatory minimums ties the hands of even a progressive judge. So, uh, for example, a lot of what I used to do involved mitigation. Mitigation is essentially you giving me information that I can then proffer to the prosecution and proffer to the court to indicate that, you know, uh, Mr. Kirkwood was in college. 
He uh, was a young dad. He's, you know, he's got a job. He's trying to do all of these things and he just ended up in a bad situation. You know, amongst our people virtually, how many people have just been in the wrong place at the wrong time? And oftentimes we see a disparate level of policing. And I'll leave you with this. What I used to see all the time in Compton was probable cause attached to riding a bicycle on the sidewalk. And it used to incense me because I went to UCLA in Westwood. You couldn't go 20 yards without seeing 50 people riding bicycles on the sidewalk. And none of those people were detained and searched. None of them. So that disparate kind of policing, I think, goes to the heart of both of these issues. So I want to encourage these young people to continue to inform yourselves, continue to educate yourself, because the most dangerous thing in the world is somebody with street knowledge and book knowledge. So go out there and get it. Awesome. So I think all three of you highlight an important point that it's one thing to sort of recognize these problems, um, but the hard part and the hard work comes from trying to find the solutions to sort of address all of these things uh, in depth. Um, so our audience has some specific questions for each of you. Um, I will start with Ms. Johal. Um, the question for you from Destiny is, um, are there any obstacles and problems that you face specifically as a woman in the field of law, um, which tends to be a male dominated profession? Uh, that's a great question, Destiny. Thank you for that one. Um, I, I think the answer is yes. Um, it obviously is a, a male dominated profession. I think that's um, changing somewhat and I hope it continues to do so. I know that uh, my graduating law school class um, was fairly split 50-50, uh, but when I went to um, law firms after law school, you started to see that those numbers at the top were, were not equally represented there. Um, probably no different than what you may face in school or in a job, any other job or everyday life. I think there's a, f a few things uh, that have been challenging uh, because of uh, the fact that I'm a woman. And I think it goes back to a lot of those implicit biases that uh, we discuss in the context of race as well. Um, you know, one example is uh, I know that colleagues of mine, for example, when have they've been on cases, a lot of times, especially if you're on the litigation side like myself, will work on a large case team and be in a conference room and there'll be subtle things like uh, a partner or someone more senior asking someone to take notes um, and uh, defaulting to asking the female in the room to do so. Oftentimes I was in a conference room where I was one of the only females, if not the only. Um, and so subtleties like that, um, you know, uh, another thing that I've faced um, in the field thus far is sort of an overemphasis on my appearance or my dress that I don't think is represented um, in, in males. There's a type of scrutiny that males get. So whether I'm wearing a business suit that's a pants suit or a skirt suit or, or things that I think about um, that I'm sure uh, the men in the room don't think about uh, uh, when they get dressed in the morning. Um, and I also think just generally uh, making your voice heard in your seat at your ta at the table. I think that's a lot of what inspires me to be involved um, here tonight, and especially for the young women in the room that are taking these opportunities to find their voice and to gain confidence and being able to speak up is a really powerful thing. Um, another example I can give is I've taken quite a number of depositions, and I often find that I receive a lot of aggression back when the my counterpart on the other side is a male. And I don't know for a fact that it's because I'm a female. It could be because I'm off, I'm also uh, younger um, and I've taken depositions where my counterparts have been older. But whether it's because I'm a female or because I'm younger, I, I do think one or both of those factors are at play um, where, where I sort of take a strong opinion on something. And even if I'm doing it in sort of a calm or a uh, monotone voice, which typically is my style, I find that I'm, I'm facing a lot of aggression or being talked to in somewhat of a, a condescending tone. And so, you know, I think unfortunately those are just the realities that um, women in the field face. I think it's not unique to this industry. I think, you know, most recently you've probably seen it in the vice presidential debates. Um, and so it's just, uh, you know, something to be aware of. And, you know, my response to sort of ideas about how to approach that is to just really 
sort of my approach has always been to sort of focus on the substance in my work and and be confident speaking up in a room and sort of standing my ground when I know that I'm right or I have something meaningful to say. And um, when you're in those rooms, assuming you're not already, um, I, I hope you do the same. Awesome. Well, thank you all for your perspective. And uh, for the folks in the audience, if I didn't get to your question, I'm sorry about that. Um, but panelists, in a moment, you'll be stepping off the stage. Feel free to interact with the questions that folks are asking you directly in the chat um, before we move on to the next section. Um, so with that, uh, so thank you to the audience for all your questions. Hopefully some of the panelists will get back to you in the chat for ones that I wasn't able to ask uh, out loud and on the stage. Now it's time to get back to our debate where Dana Egbidi and Amina Reyes will be giving closing statements um, for their sides of the debate. Uh, while we had that panelist section, uh, they were taking the time to prepare their speeches um, and to take into account a lot of the panelist feedback. Um, so joining me on the stage now is Amina and Dana. Following the closing statements from these two debaters, um, they will be given feedback by the panelists with closing remarks by the Honorable Judge Watford. Amina, are you ready? Yes, I am. All right, the floor is yours and goodbye. Greetings, my name is Amina Reyes, and today I will be summarizing why mandatory minimums do more harm than good. I will also incorporate the feedback from our esteemed panel as I demonstrate the racial bias in sentencing policy. Mandatory minimums represent a credible threat that prosecutors can use to convince a defendant to take a plea deal. This means that mandatory minimums are what give plea bargains power. This robs those who are less guilty of their chance to have a less serious offense on their criminal record, resolve the matter quickly, and avoid a messy trial that could potentially harm their reputation. Even if prosecutors cannot give plea bargains anymore, the minimum sentence will still be implemented. Mandatory minimum sentences were passed to ensure that certain criminals serve long prison sentences. However, these laws are cruel and ineffective. Mandatory minimum laws strip a judge of their authority to consider the actual circumstances of the crime or the defendant's individual characteristics. I will highlight three places we see the impacts of these laws and why they need to be eliminated. First, it is important to remember while federal judges have the wisdom and training to identify the most serious drug offenders and hand down the appropriate sentences, mandatory minimum sentences are set by Congress, not judges. As a result, judges cannot lower these sentences even for extenuating circumstances that will otherwise lessen the punishment. This proves to be the biggest problem with mandatory minimum sentencing. Referring back to the story of Atiba Parker in which she was charged 42 years for carrying three ounces of crack, we see a perfect example of why eliminating minimums is necessary. To further extend the answer to Mr. Kirkwood's question about recidivism, I would like to say the prior idea of dealing with recidivism was to increase defendant's, sen defendant's sentences. However, this created even more damage. In order to combat this issue, we need to stop, recognize, and understand why do people keep committing crimes and how to tackle these issues without throwing them in jail. Second, mandatory minimums has disproportionately impacted people of color. The 1994 crime bill created a five-year minimum for particular drug-related crimes, but not for others. This created racial bias in our criminal justice system. We can see this when we compare the amount of time you are sentenced for having weed and heroin in your possession. Statistically, the majority of people who are charged with the possession of weed are minorities. But as for the possession of heroin, the majority is white. The federal mandatory minimum sentence for carrying five plants of weed will get you a minimum of five years in prison. On the other hand, having 100 grams of heroin will get you a minimum of zero years in prison. Bobby Rush even publicly said that he is ashamed for voting for the 1994 crime bill. Third, these racial disparities exacerbate mass incarceration. Mandatory minimums lead to prison overcrowding for nonviolent offenders. Offenders who may have sh um, received short sentences or none at all are in prison for years due to mandatory sentencing. Since 2010, prison populations have slowly reduced from small reforms, but it is still a significant issue. Near the end of 2010, the population of inmates carrying mandatory minimum sentences were 108,022. By 2016, this number only saw a modest decrease of federal inmates to 92,870. Over 3,000 prisoners are currently sentenced to life without parole for nonviolent crimes due to the unfair mandatory minimums or enhancements. America locks up more prisoners than any country in the world. 
that number will continue to be sustained unless we eliminate these mandatory, mandatory minimums. While we agree that plea bargains have resulted in unfair outcomes, we believe they only have the power they do is because of mandatory minimums. By eliminating mandatory minimums, minimize these threats. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm excited and eager to be here today to gain a new perspective on criminal justice reform. There are three reasons that the plea bargaining system requires reform. First, plea bargaining conflates justice with socioeconomic status by targeting vulnerable defendants. Emma Faye Stewart, an African-American single mother of two, trusted her court appointed lawyer to convey her innocent plea following her alleged involvement in a drug ring. Instead, she was misled into believing that she faced a, 90, a 99 year sentence, despite a lack of credible evidence in her case. Fearing Fearing for her children, Stewart pled guilty. Like many other defendants in drug-related cases, Stewart was coerced by a predatory policy. Um, her plea reflected her fear of being in, unavailable, un, unavailable um, to provide for her family while imprisoned, rather than her involvement with drugs, with drug-related crimes. Second, plea bargaining is exceedingly pr prevalent in sentencing in the sentencing process. Predatory bargains are the norm for are the norm of the criminal justice system, not an exception. The vast majority of trials between 90 to 95 end with a bargain rather than a trial. Through negotiating with defendants alone, prosecutors capitalize on their fear and uncertainty. Um, to, too often, innocent defendants are intimidated out of going to trial. For undocumented individuals, the prevalence of bar bargaining has an additional adverse consequence. Historically, prosecutors have coerced undocumented defendants into stating that they have no present fear of torture, thereby disqualifying themselves from asylum. For non-citizens, plea bargaining plea bargains are a convert are, are convert immigration policy. Um, third. Plea bargaining amplifies the discriminatory practices of mandatory minimums. Our Opponents are correct in identifying mandatory minimums as a racialized tool and have been and that has been weaponized to target vulnerable communities. Still, mandatory minimums are not um, dangerous, are not only dangerous um, because they cause extended sentences. Uh, often, innocent defendants are coerced into taking a plea deal because they are afraid of facing a mandatory minimum sentence. Sufficient policy solutions must address the interconnectedness of these issues. By adding a judge to the bargaining process, prosecutors have to reach a higher threshold for evidence to be considered credible. As each of our esteemed panelists have noted, judges are not exempt from racial bias and have to remain in the line with and have an incentive to remain in line with the prosecutors. Still, their proposal still our proposal relies on judges to be skeptical of the qual of the quality of evidence and bargaining and the, the bargaining process only becomes coercive when prosecutors intentionally distort the potential outcomes of cases. Judges would limit prosecutors broad powers to threaten unreasonably high charges or lengthen trial times to pressure defendants into accepting a plea deal. Judges could would act as adversaries challenging any unfounded claims in the prosecutor's line of reasoning. Even in the absence of mandatory minimums, defendants remain unaware of the quality, quantity and quality of evidence in their cases, leading them to be easily manipulated in order to establish a um, equitable criminal justice system. Reforms must be addressed must must address the predatory nature of plea bargains. Thank you. Hi everyone. I am Paul Watford. Uh, I'm a judge on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, my chambers are here in Pasadena, California. I uh, have been asked to give uh, to start out the process of giving you guys some feedback, um, and I will uh, tell you uh, just a, a little bit about my relative disadvantage here because I did not participate in debate uh, in either high school or college. So this is all new to me. And I wasn't sure, uh, to be honest, quite what to expect uh, coming into tonight. And I have to say, I have been so impressed um, by what I've seen and just the, um, the skills that you all have developed in the course of uh, preparing for this debate and uh, the, the work that you put into uh, researching the issues, um, it just, uh, it really demonstrates 
the range of skills that you um, uh, that you have to develop to, to become a, a skilled debater. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll give a couple of uh, observations just about the process as I observed it, uh, and then comment a little bit on the, the two issues that you all have focused on. After that, the, uh, the panelists will return and give you hopefully some more focused feedback on your individual performances. Um, the, I guess the, the first thing that struck me is just how much research, uh, as you've heard before, how much research each of you had to, to put in uh, to become knowledgeable about the subjects that, that you all were, um, you were arguing about. Um, your ability to just marshal facts and marshal evidence um, to, to sort out you know, which facts and, and which evidence would be uh, persuasive and, and you know, which facts would not be. Um, it's just a, it's an extraordinary skill that you will um, be able to put to good use, whether you end up going on to law school, as, as some of you have suggested you want to, uh, or really whatever you end up doing uh, in, uh, in life. Um, the other thing that each of you put on uh, real strong display is just your critical thinking skills. Um, that is something that we need so badly right now, right? Uh, in, in the, uh, uh, the, the state of sort of civil discourse that we have now going on in society, we need people who can think critically and um, to really focus in on which arguments um, have power, uh, which arguments um, will sort of get you to truth and which won't. Um, and I was just so impressed by how each of you uh, really honed in on the, uh, the key points that, uh, uh, that were most persuasive for the, uh, the positions you were taking. Um, the, uh, the ability to defend your positions in the face of questioning um, is also uh, an incredibly valuable skill that um, at least a couple of you had to demonstrate. Uh, it's very easy, I think, <clears throat> in the face of you know, somewhat hostile questioning to, uh, to get defensive or to um, sort of lose focus in, in terms of what the, uh, the key points are that you're trying to drive home. And um, I just, I love the, the way this, um, uh, this exercise forces you to, um, to think on your feet, certainly, and to, uh, to really zero in on the, uh, again, on the points that are going to hopefully persuade your audience uh, that, your, uh, that your side is right. So the, the entire uh, process has just been uh, a really eye-opening to me, and, and I can understand now uh, much better why um, you guys as debaters uh, have such a high likelihood of going on to, uh, to become leaders in society because uh, the, the skills that you're uh, forced to develop and to hone uh, in this process uh, will be incredibly value, valuable as you go forward in life. Uh, I'll just close by offering a couple of comments on the, uh, the two issues that you all have, have been debating. Um, you know, the plea bargaining process uh, in federal court, uh, which is the, that's the, system that I'm most familiar with. I was a federal prosecutor for several years um, before uh, I, I went into private practice. Um, on the federal side, judges are forbidden to be involved in the plea bargaining process. That is a really strict divide um, that the federal courts have developed in part because the fear is that if the judge, certainly the judge who is gonna be involved in sentencing the defendant gets involved in the plea bargaining process, there's a danger that the judge's comments will uh, uh, be uh, taken from by the defendant as coercing the defendant into perhaps pleading guilty um, because of fear that you know the judge is, has, uh, has already developed a view about whether the defendant is guilty and, and perhaps you know what kind of, of sentence the defendant should face. So for that reason, um, contrary to the position that uh, that we've heard tonight, uh, on the federal side at least, uh, there's been a real push to keep judges out of uh, the plea bargaining process. My main suggestion would be if, if judges were to be involved, you would definitely not want the judge who was going to be the ultimate sentencer to be the judge involved. You'd want some neutral judge um, who could perhaps come in and, and uh, hopefully educate himself or herself about the facts and be in a position to give the defendant maybe a uh, uh, an unbiased and, and realistic uh, view of, you know, what the likelihood of conviction was and uh, what the potential range of sentences are. But to have the judge who's ultimately going to issue the sentence be involved uh, poses a lot of dangers. And I'm not sure that the, um, 
that the proposals that we uh, that we heard uh, tonight necessarily reflected uh, re reflected that insight. Um, the your focus on mandatory minimums is just spot on. Uh, that has been um, the, I mean, perhaps the leading um, reason why there is so much injustice on the sentencing front. Uh, we have had federal judges who, who literally quit the bench because they just could no longer, um, they just no longer felt comfortable being part of a system in which they were forced to hand out 20, 30 year uh, long sentences for people who had committed minor drug crimes. And it's just the uh, no judge wants to be forced uh, to be a, uh, you know, a, a participant in, in inflicting that kind of injustice. And um, your uh, your calls for abolishing mandatory minimum, certainly for nonviolent drug offenses, uh, just strike me as as completely uh, completely justified. Um, the last thing I'll say is uh, one part of the uh, problem uh, that you all have focused on on both the plea bargaining front and the mandatory minimum sentence front is the incredible power that prosecutors hold um, in, in our criminal justice system. And what I, I hope part of the lesson perhaps you all will take away from that, that realization is that what we need are better prosecutors, prosecutors who have a sense of compassion, a more balanced sense of justice. Um, the, the, the trend for so long had been for anyone who had a more balanced sense of, of justice to uh, become a defense lawyer and basically to leave the role of prosecutor to those who um, uh, perhaps did not have, uh, do not have that, that perspective. And what I would encourage you all, if you ever do become lawyers or if you know people who become lawyers, um, encourage people who have compassion and have a balanced sense of justice to become prosecutors because that is really um, the, the, you know, the part of the criminal justice system where so much of the power lies. And as judges, a, a lot of times, um, you know, we're just not in a position to, uh, to correct um, some of the abuses that go on at the prosecutorial level. So um, with that, I will uh, I'll leave you guys uh, back to, to the hands of the panelists who I think will be rejoining to, um, to provide some uh, feedback on your individual performances. So thank you. It was a pleasure to uh, to be able be a, a part of this event tonight. Hello, ladies. How are you? Hello, I'm great. How are you? Good, good. Well, initially, Ms. Reyes, I wanted to uh, commend you on your delivery of the speech because uh, more often than not, if, for example, you cook a delicious meal, if it's served cold you don't exactly get to enjoy the flavors uh, as to what is being prepared. Uh, the note that I gave your predecessors, I can see that you took to heart because your points may be coded and poignant, but if they are too fast, I cannot hear them. So uh, I truly appreciate you taking that note. Uh, moreover, I thought your pacing was superb. I loved the emphasis that you placed on certain words. You are absolutely a powerful public speaker. Um, specifically, stop, recognize, and understand. Those kinds of statements will capture a jury. Because I have found most jurors are bored to tears. Even if you're dealing with something that's really salacious, like multiple murder, or like just crazy things, they get bored. So those points that you had and the uh, means by which you portrayed, you gave them, uh, I thought it was superb. Um, I, I know this is sort of pedestrian, but I especially enjoyed uh, your use of polysyllabics. Uh, sometimes people don't know how to use certain words and they uh, misappropriate their vocabulary. <laughs> but your use of exacerbate was dead on perfect. And I silently went, yay, that's awesome. Uh, Ms. Egbede, uh, first of all, I want to advise you that you have joined the ranks of those privileged few who have uh, dealt with uh, technical issues. Uh, in the middle of, of what is clearly a ton of work. So uh, initially, I want to commend your research ability. I want to commend your ability to sort of uh, think on your feet and kind of stay on your toes by sending the uh, uh, speech in question to Brianna. And I want to encourage you to continue uh, in what you're doing. 
uh, honestly, I wish I had had the opportunity to actually hear you speak, but substantively, I was able to inculpate the, uh, th the thrust of what you were trying to say, and thematically, I could not agree with you more. So uh, to both of you young ladies, uh, I commend you highly. I am thoroughly impressed, and I hope that my daughter uh, is uh, much like the both of you. So uh, thank you. I likewise want to echo Craig's sentiments. You all did a fantastic job, um, both you, Amina, and Dana, with your substance. And Brianna and Andrew, who I can't see right now, I also wanted to provide a little bit of feedback for you both as well, since I didn't earlier. Um, Brianna, I think that you have a very calm demeanor about yourself, which is very um, is very effective in, in this type of scenario. And I think that's one of the great things about a stage like this is you all had your own sense of style, but it was effective for different reasons. Um, Brianna, I think I mentioned that you did a great job of outlining your points in the beginning. Um, you'll see that even if you go on to be an attorney or a trial lawyer or litigate in any way, that's something that's really emphasized uh, in our practice as well. So that your audience understands where you're going uh, at the outset of your argument, and it makes it really easy to follow along. I know that Andrew did the same things as well. Um, you know, another thing I really appreciated about you, Brianna, was um, when Mr. Kirkwood was asking you some really tough questions, you acknowledged the other side in your argument. So when there were points in those questions that might have shined on a valid argument for the other side of your position, you acknowledge that sort of arguable weakness in your position um, before carrying on, which I always appreciate seeing because there always are uh, multiple sides to an argument. Um, my one comment of, for feedback for you, Brianna, is just to slow down. Um, I think you were our fastest speaker tonight. I tr struggled with that when I did public speaking. I probably still do. Um, one of the pieces of advice that was given to me was, to speak with what might sound to you like a forcibly slow uh, cadence and that to everyone else in the audience will sound normal. Um, and some techniques for that are just as awkward as it may be is just try recording yourself once or twice and, and playing it back and you'll get a sense of, a sense of that. Um, Cause I think you had a lot of great substance and really effective arguments. And unfortunately I think I missed just a few of them um, due to the speed, but you did a fantastic job otherwise. Um, Andrew, you had a really great projection about you, and I felt like there was, it was almost conversational in the way that you communicated. Uh, there was a lot of naturalness to the way that you spoke that I felt that even despite being across screens, uh, we were just having a conversation about the issue. And I think that's also a different style than, than Brianna's and then Amina's that I'm going to talk about, but it was equally effective. Um, I also uh, appreciated the way that in talking about the sub subject matters, you used um, possessive pronouns. So you talked about things about like our community and sort of insert, inserting yourself in uh, the population that you were speaking about, I thought was a really, really effective tool that um, stood out to me. Um, I also thought that you had really great examples in your debate, which I think just sort of helped paint sort of a picture of, of what the practical impact are is of mandatory um, minimums. And so I always think when you can draw on those examples, it sort of helps highlight your points, which I appreciated. Um, Amina, you were such a passionate speaker and I so appreciated that. I think uh, more so than any of the other speakers, I think that you um, showed really showed your heart in the issue. And again, to see the three different styles, I think was fantastic and all effective. Um, but I really like the passion and the strength behind your words and knowing when to emphasize that. I think it was intentional on your part and, and really effective. Um, you went back to examples that Andrew used, which I also thought was really effective because those were some of the examples that stuck in my mind when he spoke. And then to draw back on them again, just took me back there and re sort of emphasized um, how striking some of these incidences are that you guys spoke about and that really help uh, defend the, the argument that you're coming from. Um, you also did a great job of um, harping back on to some of the feedback that the panelists uh, uh, spoke about. I think, Dana, you did a great job of that as well. I think both of you, I'm so impressed that you did that in such a short amount of time, 
sort of took notes on what the three of us said and then drew back onto that and incorporated it into your arguments. Both did that really effectively. Um, and I think, Amina, the specific, specific example you used in your substance when you talked about um, the differences and minimums for the use of heroin and the use of marijuana um, and how those represent the two different racial disparities um, was really effective as well. So that was great. Um, and Dana, I'm so sorry that we didn't get to hear you speak. I'm sure you're equally bummed, but I know you'll have an opportunity again in the future. And I want to just touch upon some of the points of your substance because I think it was, it was really strong. Um, I think one of your earlier lines about um, how, uh, you know, conflating justice with socioeconomic status. That was just a really effective line for me at the beginning and something that I think was sort of a great headline or tag for where you were going thereafter. I think the way you described that was really effective and a lot of your terminology throughout your, uh, your speech was as well. I know that you used the term predatory bargaining at one time, and I thought using the word predatory was really effective in terms of your argument as well. And uh, continuing to use adjectives throughout your speech, like dangerous um, and predatory, sort of re-emphasize that theme throughout. Um, I think you did one of the strongest jobs of acknowledging the interconnectedness of these two issues and bringing that up in your speech, which was effective as well. Um, and then lastly, just what I noted when I was talking about Amina, but also incorporating all of our, our comments. Um, all four of you did a fantastic job, and I'm, I'm really happy to have been a part of this and hear your arguments. You know, I know, I know we've gone long, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just be short. I, I, I do like everybody's preparation and uh, passion. You know, um, I think that, you know, it's always tough, you know, when you're policy debaters and you have to talk to people who are not policy judges. So I, I understand the uh the speaking fast thing um one thing that i would say that i always used to do regardless of the judges i was in front of is even if i was speaking fast to get a lot of information in i would always slow down for the points that i thought were the most important that i wanted people to remember um and you know, it, it, there's ways to give emphasis. Every argument isn't the same. And I think you get um, credibility with judges by showing that, that you're aware of that. And it's where you vary emotion. You know, as Kira said about Amina, you know, emotion was really good. You know, when you slow down for emphasis, um, et cetera. Hi, my name is Leo Villanueva and I'm the program manager at the Los Angeles Metropolitan Debate League. I want to thank you all for participating in this iResolve event. From our student debaters to our panelists and our special guests, as well as our incredible partners at Noddle, we are grateful for your commitment to support of Lambda. As a former student of Lambda, I know how this program has impacted my life and the lives of thousands of other public school students across LA County. In 2008, I was part of the first cohort of Lambda students. At the time, we only had about a handful of schools with about 50 debaters. I tried other activities in school like student government, academic decathlon, and even powder pot. These were great experiences, but everything I learned in debate, I still practice to this day. Debate stuck with me because it was the first time I felt belonging in a community. I felt accepted, empowered, and respected. Our success is directly related to the strong support of our schools, our teachers who coaches these incredible students, our judges and volunteers, and our board of directors, including our board chairs, Henry Wiseman and Bart Williams, who have been behind our work since the very beginning. We couldn't do this important and necessary work without our community and supporters across LA County and nationally. Right now, we have launched our back to school campaign to support our many programs. As with most programs across, LA, the, across the city, we have been tremendously impacted by the pandemic and school closures. Your support will help us continue to offer our programs virtually, support student recruitment and teacher training, online lecture series, as well as a full schedule of over 20 debate tournaments for our students. Your tax deductible donation also comes with some perks as we have released exclusive merchandise as a thank you gift. 
please visit our GoFundMe, gofundme.com slash the lame back to school. It will also be in the comments and please check out our website for, for, for a full tournament schedule, lambdell.org. Thank you for your support and see you at the next debate.